continental, like India and the States, etc., but we are in a developing world. So we still, are on higher education, we, our open universities has just been, it's got a three or four years it was established, although we have a 200 million population, we have almost, we're trying to reach 10 million students by 2011. We have something like 6 million students in higher education nowadays. And the, the distance education courses are really increasing in all modalities. But if you go, for example, we have difficulties up north. In the northern part of Brazil, the roads are rivers. So how, you get pe how do you get people physically to classes? It's very difficult. So media like television, which is something that the Brazilian people are very used to, are used massively for uh, higher and even secondary high school education. So we're still probably in the long run going to be experiencing a massive, maybe teaching, not a teaching tool as, uh, as, as technology, right? It would, as technology would be the, the teaching process itself as Brenda suggests but I still see it as a very effective tool to reach specific public in the combinations of technology that, that are available. So that would be basically a quick overview of what we have. One of the other things that emerged seems to be a divide between uh, north and south or developed and less developed. Um, the north or the developed world can afford the technology. The south in many countries can't. Do you run the risk of being left behind? I, 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 I don't think the statement is actually quite reflective of the situation. Uh, if, if, if one were to look at Asia, I mean, it's not an uh, undifferentiated mass. It, uh, you know, Asia is uh, uh, quite a heterogeneous uh, country. There are nations in Asia which have a technological infrastructure and the ability to, 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 to use, uh, purchase, uh, uh, and, and service. Uh, which are far ahead of anything you would see in the so-called so -called North. I'm thinking of Korea, South Korea, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, to just, just, just name, name a few. There are uh, other nations where the infrastructure may not be as, 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 uh, uh, as rich as one would wish to uh, see in terms of exploiting it for purposes of education. But even there, you know, if you look at countries, uh, say, in South Asia, the ownership of mobile telephones is literally, you know, multiplying manifold. And the, the, you, you, we, probably, we will be hearing from Sam Petroda this, this evening, and he'd probably describe how far ahead these this, 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 this facilities are moving, and you are, have other nations in between. So I don't think the question of being left behind because of the technology infrastructure is a real, real fear. But the fear I have is the inability of educational systems and workers in education to manage the technology for, uh, for their purpose, effectively, efficiently, and productively. I think that lack of skills is real. It's real in, at the workers' level, it's real at the managerial level, and it's frightening at the leadership level. Fair enough. We do have our first question from the internet. Uh, Frank from Amsterdam asked, is a worldwide learning and interactive platform for students a threat to the existence of universities? Susan. I, th I think it's absolutely an enhancement to, uh, to the success of universities in the future. We, we teach our students to be global uh, global thinkers and to uh, be prepared to go out into a global environment. There, there's nothing better than utilizing the, the technological advancements that we have today through, uh, through the internet to connect faculty members from around the world, to connect students from around the world, to collaborate on, uh, on joint courses, for example, with perspectives from different countries and, and, uh, and different cultures. We have the opportunity to utilize uh, these new uh, open courseware, open content to really share information in, in countries uh, and in organizations that might not have access to that information otherwise. We, we have to manage it carefully, but uh, the, the real issue is ensuring that we have quality and that we uh, ensure access for our students. The, 
The global environment that we're in today really gives us an opportunity also to find some of the best minds in the world and to bring them into our classroom. We're able to take individuals from the World Health Organization to teach public health in our classrooms, to have streaming video, for example. And as the bandwidth increases around the world for various countries, they're going to have access, their young students and college students are going to have access to some of the most brilliant minds around the world that may not be physically in their classroom, but that they'll have the opportunity uh, to, uh, to talk to, to interact with in ways that we've never had before. And if you take Raj's point, the leadership of the universities are not very good at using it, at least not yet. At least in my context. At least in your I, context. I think, it's, it's not I think the way I see it. My lens may be a little tainted, by the way. <laughs> I heard it globally. Severus, your comments. Well, I, I, I agree with Susan. I don't see it as a threat. The, the, I think that it changes the, the role that the quality education universities have. As you said, you can bring in people and you can conduct a process and enhance the communities to actually be more effective on the learning process, right? The, the thing is that obviously the paradigm is going to change in terms of how people go about that and how people accept sometimes to collaborate. I still think that the world is not mature for collaboration. I think we're very far away from collectivism. We're still in, in, a, in a more interactive, collaborative, in, initial collaborative environment, but I think that it would never be a threat. You, you would have the chance to really uh, expose quality content and maybe quality education. The, the example I bring up is, um, it's unbelievable how people go into quality content uh, our institution was the first institution to put up some content, real simple content, on the Open Courseware Consortium led by MIT. So we, we put up two courses in partnership with the University of California at Irvine. And uh, in the first 10 days, we had like 20,000 hits. In the first month, 50,000 hits. And then, uh, as Brazil likes certificates, they started asking for certificates. So we put up a system where we started tracking down people who went to our courses. They had to fill in a form if they had to get an online certificate. And once completing activities, they could print one. And I'm talking about 10 or 15 hour courses here. So we actually put up two more courses. We became a full member of the consortium. And from July 2008 to May 2009, we had more than 500,000 hits. 174,000 forms filled and 93,000 certificates of people that we don't know of and they're getting real quality stuff. So, and it hasn't affected us. It's just made me say now that I can say that I'm a, over 120,000 student organization. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, it's no threat, you know. We, we're getting students. Part of this we've tracked down of, it's a small percentage, but that has been converted to regular students. So we I don't see it as a threat. That's really okay. open. Can I, may I, may I add Certainly. a point, yeah. point on that? I think the, 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 the question was whether the, the, the fear of threat to, to, to conventional systems. I, I, you know, at least for the, uh, the, the Brazilian experience is, 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 is illustrating certification. You know, through charter, through approvals, through uh, 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 what's this, uh, accreditation, our universities, self-accreditation by the way, our universities have the singular monopoly of delivering credits and certification. As long as they enjoy that, there's no fear of threat. I think Brenda's talked about unbundling when that unbundling really, really happens, and if Microsoft can give a certificate that, uh, as they do now, uh, that gets accepted and recognized, uh, that would be the time when you'd begin to see threat as an issue. Because open universities have a mass catchment to, to, to reach out to.